evening. You hopefully recall that we have defined a miracle as follows, quote, a specific event that would not have happened if only the natural order had been operating, where the natural order is understood to involve physical entities, their interactions, and the actions and interactions of animals, humans, and beings with powers much like ours, end quote. Following the definition offered by Timothy and Lydia McGrew. In addition, my thesis in this paper was that miracles as defined are possible events which are identifiable and distinguishable from natural events whose validity can be investigated by reason and historical inquiry. Now, having already invested a short amount of time on the definition of miracles part one, and, and in order to move the discussion forward on the possibility of miracles, I'd like now to uh, move the discussion to the issue of identification of miracles. Specifically, my aim is to answer the question, if a miracle were to occur, how would we know it is a miracle? If one searches for the term miracle in the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy, the second edition, three problems of identification are listed there. Namely, one, is the event in question a violation of a natural law, and what are natural laws? Two, did the event in question happen in the first place? And three, is God the cause of the violation? While this work defines a miracle as a violation of nature, these three aspects are still worthy of note even though I am not defining a miracle as a violation of nature. Since the definition I am using does not cohere with number one specifically, we can reinterpret one as follows. What distinguishes the event in question from naturalistic events or explanations? Let's take these questions in order to establish how one could begin to identify a miracle. The first and probably the most important problem that we need to address is the following question. If miracles occur, what differentiates these events from ordinary events so that they cannot be explained naturalistically? Bluntly, how can we tell any given event is a miracle or a naturally occurring event? William Craig correctly notes the importance of the context surrounding the event. He writes, quote, The question is, what serves to distinguish a genuine miracle from a mere scientific anomaly? Here, the religious historical context of the event becomes crucial. A miracle without a context is inherently ambiguous, but if a purported miracle occurs in, this, in a significant religio-historical context, then the chances of it being a genuine miracle are increased." End quote. Michael Lacona both corroborates Craig's insights on context and adds a second identification criteria of probability. Lacona writes, quote, I would like to suggest that if we modify Dembski's criteria for specified complexity, we can formulate miracle identifying criteria that are conceptual and pragmatically correct. We may recognize that an event is a miracle when the event is, one, an extremely unlikely to have occurred given the circumstances and or natural law, and two, the event occurs in an environment or context charged with a religious significance. In other words, the event occurs in a context where we might expect a god to act. The stronger the context is charged in this direction, the stronger the evidence becomes that we have a miracle on our hands." End quote. To these two criteria, Stephen Belensky adds four more. Succinctly, Belensky's criteria argue that the event in question should have adequate evidence for its occurrence, natural explanation should not come across as clumsy or ad hoc, and the inexplicability of the event should be both present and point to some justification for supernatural explanations to be posited. Given the aforementioned thoughts on criteria to assist in miracle identification, we can formulate a workable set of criteria as follows. 1. The event in question occurs in a religious historical context. 2. The event in question is extremely unlikely and or inexplicable given natural law. And 3. There is adequate evidence that the event occurred, equal to other unusual but accepted events. Given these criteria, it is my view that we can identify a, an event as a miracle. Allow me to provide a possible example of an event that could meet these three criteria and be counted as a miracle if it occurred. The reversal of biological death. The key term here is biological death, as clinically there's another type of death. In the medical community, there's a distinction between a pronouncement of clinical death, or reversible death, and biological death, or irreversible death. In clinical death, external life signs such as consciousness, pulse, and breathing are absent. In such cases, biological death virtually always results if no steps are taken to, to reverse the process. Biological death, on the other hand, is not affected by any amount of attention for it is physically irreversible. Many scholars such as Moody add a category between these two, the absence of brainwave activity, indicated by a flat EEG reading. That's a quote from Habermas. 
If someone were to come back from biological death, this would be inexplicable in naturalistic terms, as it is physically impossible to reverse biological death. More specifically, take the claim made by Christians that Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead. William Lane Craig notes, quote, The central miracle of the New Testament, the resurrection of Jesus, was, if, if it occurred, doubtlessly a miracle. In the first place, the resurrection so exceeds what we know of the productive capacity of natural cause that it can only be reasonably attributed to a supernatural cause. The more we learn about cell neuroses, the more evident it becomes that such an event is naturally impossible. If it were the effect of unknown natural cause, then its uniqueness in human history would be inexplicable. Secondly, the supernatural explanation is given immediately in the religio-historical context in which the event occurred. Jesus' resurrection, Craig writes, was not merely an anomalous event occurring without context. It came at the climax to Jesus' own life and teachings and serves as the divine vindication of Jesus' allegedly blasphemous claims for which he was crucified. We therefore have good reason to regard Jesus' resurrection if it occurred as a true miracle." End quote. Indeed, if the resurrection of Jesus took place, we can easily conclude that it was a miracle, as it meets our criteria. The second problem that needs to be answered is the question of authenticity. Did the event happen in the first place? This question is of obvious importance to the quest to identify miracles, for if the event did not happen, then it would be a waste of time to claim that the miracle occurred. Here we see the importance of taking miracle claims in a case-by-case -case basis. In my view, it is up to history and reason to investigate miracle claims, if they are made in the past, that is, to determine the question of authenticity. Again, if the event did not happen, then the miracle claim has no warrant. It must be shown by historical means or another investigative approach that the event occurred before we can claim it to be a genuine occurrence of a miracle. This is pretty commonsensical. Third and the last problem that needs to be addressed in the quest for identifying events as possible miracles is the importance of inferring God as the cause when naturalistic explanations come up lacking. Again, the claims for miracles need to be taken in a case-by-case -case basis. One way we might be able to reasonably suggest supernatural activity is by looking at the religio-historical context. If an event has a rich religious historical context and is inexplicable naturalistically, then we have possible support for a claim of supernatural activity. Take the resurrection of Jesus as an example. Timothy and Lydia McGrew comment on the importance of inexplicability. They write, quote, The concept of a miracle makes sense even on account of nature that predates the notion of natural law, so long as there is a normal order of nature as a background against which the miracle stands out. The resurrection of Jesus, if it in fact took place, would be a paradigm example of a miracle, end quote. Habermas and Lacona comment on the importance of religio-historical context as well. They write, quote, Are there any strong reasons to believe that someone other than God raised Jesus from the dead? No one else has claimed responsibility, and there is no evidence that someone else did it. Yet we do have Jesus' claims that his resurrection would be evidence that he had divine authority. We do have the claims of alleged eyewitnesses who were taught by the risen Jesus and claimed that God raised him, end quote. In other words, we could infer supernatural activity since the event in question stands in stark contrast to naturalistic explanations and occurs in a religious historical context. Again, the strength of an occurrence being said to originate with God will correlate with the strength of the context, the actual occurrence, and the failure of naturalistic explanations. Craig notes, quote, Indeed, only if atheism were proved to be true could one rationally deny the epistemic possibility of miracles. For if it is even epistemically possible that a transcendent personal God exists, then it is equally possible that he has acted in the universe." End quote. A second way we may reasonably suggest supernatural activity is by using an inference to the best possible explanation. Apart from withholding judgment and ascribing a naturalistic cause, we are left with two further options. We may either suggest that the event has no causal explanation, that it occurred by chance alone, or it has a non-natural explanation. Douglas Gavette writes, quote, Since no event has ever been definitively identified as a chance event, it would seem appropriate to assign a non-naturalistic power or agent as the cause of the event we are now considering abstract. Furthermore, it must be assumed that the non-natural power or agent responsible for the event must have the degree of power and ingenuity to cause the event in question. This argument is construed as an inference to the best possible explanation for certain anomalous states of affairs. Notice that it does not first argue to miracles and then from miracles to God. 
Rather, it reasons two miracles in the very act of reasoning to God. For it is not until we notice that the agent responsible for the event must be, or probably is, God, that we are in a position to call the event a miracle." End quote. In other words, we may infer God as the best possible explanation from the inherent qualities of a miracle and the context in which it occurred. Concisely, we may, be, we may deduce God from the proximity to the three criteria aforementioned. In summary, I believe the three problems for miracles identification are answerable for a subset of all miracle claims. It is not my contention to argue that all miracle claims are valid, but rather that we may take miracle claims in a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, the criteria for identification are vitally important, as is the necessity that the event occurred. The validity of miracle claims will stand or fall based on these two points. I'd like now to briefly touch on the topic of burden of proof with historical miracle claims. Now, obviously, the burden of proof would rest with the one claiming that a miracle occurred. That is not what is under special consideration here. Rather, the question regards whether miracle claims require a greater level of proof. Lacona provides a helpful overview on this subject and considers three paradigms for miracle claims. Risk assessment, the legal system, and Sagan's law. Let's take a look at each. The principle that lies behind risk assessment is as follows. When the stakes are higher, we require greater supporting evidence. An easy example of this principle is the use of investing money. Suppose you wish to make an investment in stocks and the two options in front of you are either a safer, less beneficial optional choice or a more risky, greater paying choice. If you go with the latter, you would need greater supporting evidence to move on with option two. While this point is certainly pragmatically reasonable, it doesn't seem to capture what is at stake with miracle claims. Lacona writes, quote, Although the principle is pragmatic, probabilities are not determined by our personal interests in a matter. The probability that ABC stock will quadruple is the same whether one is investing $100 or $30,000. We are simply less cautious about being mistaken when the potentially negative consequences are minimal. Pragmaticism does not necessarily assist us in ascertaining truth." End quote. Concisely, the personal stakes in a matter are not necessarily truth-seeking, but rather can be closer to wish fulfillment. It is my view that risk assessment is not a good paradigm for evaluating miracle claims for the above reasons. The second paradigm Lacona evaluates is the legal system. He subdivides this paradigm into two types of cases found within the legal system, that being civil and legal cases. In a civil case, verdicts are rendered on what is more probable than not, while in legal cases the verdicts depend on what can be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Lacona notes, quote, in other words, the stakes are higher in a criminal case and thus a greater burden of proof is required before action against the defendant may be taken, since it is a vile thing to convict the innocent, end quote. The question becomes, which type of case should miracle claims fit into? If you recall a series I did a while ago, you will hopefully recall that historical claims are typically held provisionally, and thus most historians proceed along the lines of probability, or civil cases. However, one may argue that miracle claims ought to fit in with legal cases since they call into question our internal destiny, changes of worldviews, and the prior oddness of such claims given a naturalistic worldview. However, there are apparent difficulties in such a move. For one thing, it should not be forgotten that while in legal cases the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, it is also true that the defendant, or the hypothesis, is presumed innocent until proven guilty. This seems to be the exact opposite of what the objector is trying to communicate if they want to go with legal cases. Lacona points to a second problem with demanding evidence that is beyond a reasonable doubt in regards to miracle claims. He uses the resurrection as an example. Quote, placing a higher burden of proof on the resurrection hypothesis would grossly misappropriate how burden of proof is actually employed in the legal system. The hypothesis, or the defendant, is presumed guilty or false, i.e. Methodol methodological skepticism, and its truth must be demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt before it may be accepted. This would be the equivalent of presuming the guilt of the defendant since his innocence may result in inconveniences for the jurist." End quote. Thus, if we use the legal paradigm for the level of proof, more probable than not seems more reasonable. The last paradigm contains a principle that is infamous and can be summed in the words of Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. 
The one who holds to this paradigm reasons that since miracle claims are extraordinary, given naturalism, they should then require extra proof. Many people seem to reason this way, and it seems a priori to be quite sound, but in application it is not reasonable at all. First consider the extreme constraints this principle would place on actual occurrences in history. For example, Lacona notes that the landing on the moon in 1869 was an extraordinary event. It was extremely difficult and never occurred previously. If we buy into Sagan's law, then we should be dubious that the lunar landing ever occurred. But as Lacona rightly points out, we believe the reports because we thought the reports to be credible and the authorial intent to communicate the events as occurred was known. Consider another example involving a report of alien contact by your wife, who later is corroborated by your neighbor and still later by TV broadcasts on the news later that night. Suppose further that up to this point you were extremely skeptical that aliens did exist. In this example, you have a conflict between the evidence and your understanding of reality. You may understandably pause since you regard the existence of aliens as dubious, but you should then re-examine your reasons for believing in the non-existence of aliens in light of the evidence before you that they do exist. Perhaps you would be less hasty to reject all the reports of alien sightings. You should not require extraordinary evidence, but additional evidence that addresses your present understanding of reality or your bias, which may be handicapped and is now in need of revision. As these two examples hopefully show, Sagan's law is not reasonable in application. We shouldn't demand extraordinary evidence, but sufficient evidence. Otherwise, multiple beliefs we hold to be true will crumble. Second and more importantly, we need to call into question the role of worldview and bias. Lacona makes this point brilliantly, and so I will quote him at length. Quote, The worldview of one historian does not place a greater burden on the shoulders of others. It is the responsibility of the historian to consider what the evidence would look like if she were not wearing her metaphysical bias like a pair of sunglasses that shade the world. It is not the responsibility of the evidence to shine so brightly that they render such glasses ineffectual. If the evidence for the occurrence of a particular miracle is strong, that is, the historian can establish that the authorial intent of the sources is to report what was perceived as a miracle, the event occurred in a context that was charged with a religious significance, the report possesses traits that favor the historicity of the event and no plausible naturalistic theories exist, then a requirement for extraordinary evidence is unwarranted. Some historians may require additional evidence supporting supernaturalism before believing since the event is foreign to their present horizon or bias, but no greater burden of proof is required for the miracle claim. There is a difference between demonstrating the historical superiority of a hypothesis and convincing a particular historian to give up a deeply held view." End quote. Concisely then, it would seem that if we were to adopt a paradigm for the extent of proof needed for a miracle, it would most reasonably be the use of the legal system specific to civil court cases. The burden of proof is on the one who's making the miracle claim, but all that is required is that they offer evidence that is more likely than not.